Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Storytime. Thank you so much for joining us today. I am super pumped about our guest. Um, he is one of our 2019 Aces players, Andy Young. He's still currently with the D-backs. Um, and he is one of the greatest. I know with um, John Dupontier, I bragged about how great he was both on and off the field. Andy Young is the exact same. Um, one of the nicest guys, one of the best guys in the organization. And I am so excited to catch up with him. It's been over a year since I've worked with him. So um, I hope you all enjoy hearing his story and enjoy the episode. All right, y'all, welcome back. I am here with Andy Young. Andy, how are you? I'm good. Thank you for having me, Courtney. Of course. I said in your intro, but it feels like forever since we had ace ball at the ballpark. I, it's been over a year since I've actually seen you, and I know a lot has happened. Um, so now that it's like in your off season and after this weird COVID season, what are you doing with your time now? I know you're in Arizona. Yep. So I'm in Arizona. Um, I rehab, I actually broke my handmate, so I was rehabbing that. And um, so I just got done doing that in late November and I feel good. And now I'm starting to train at a, a facility in Tempe. So I'm hitting and lifting again. So I think I'm just, just getting ready for the season at this point. Nice. And you're in the best state for the winter because I saw it's like 80 degrees back home right now. It's insane. Yeah, it's been beautiful. It's been 80 every day. Today it rained a little bit and it was kind of nice. I haven't seen rain in about three months. So that was a, a good change. Of it was all over my social media because Arizona barely sees rain. So every time it does rain, it's like my snap feed is full of just snaps of the rain, Instagram stories. Like it's a big deal when it rains in Arizona. I know. Yeah, it was nice. There you go. Well, I want to start off with the whole point of story time is for everyone to get to know you better. Um, because I know with family, friends, whoever that follows baseball, I always brag about you. I mean, the first time I met you, I was bragging about you to the foster kid that I had at the ballpark. Um, but I'm really excited for everyone to get to know you. So you're from West Fargo, North Dakota. And I was reading. I didn't know. So you were the North Dakota Gatorade Baseball Player of the Year, your senior year of high school. But what threw me off is you had a 5-0 and record as a pitcher with a 1.47 ERA. How, like, when did you give up pitching? I had no idea that you were even a pitcher. <laughs> um, I was a high school pitcher. Um, I don't think I could throw nearly hard enough to throw even in college. <laughs> but in North Dakota, it was pretty good, and I had a good defense behind me, and we had a really good team, so that helped. But um, – uh, when I was done with high school, I kind of quit pitching, but it was fun. I really liked it, but I just, I don't think I, I threw hard enough to, to do anything past high school. <laughs> I know in 2019, I don't know if you were with the team yet. I can't, I mean, all the games obviously been together now, but I think we were getting our butts kicked so much that they threw Wyatt out there to pitch. Could mm -hmm. you have done better than Wyatt Matheson though? Oh, I think Wyatt did pretty well, minus one outing in, in uh, <laughs> Vegas. But I think a position player pitching is such a unique art. It's you're not going to blow anyone away. So it doesn't really do you. Um, it doesn't help you to throw hard, you know, so <laughs> you have to perfect the 55 mile per hour fastball, which why it's pretty good at. And I don't know if I I've never tried it. I don't know. I uh, that wasn't in my repertoire in high school, but he pretty good <laughs> yeah he actually did it was funny because there it's on video of him just laughing as he's walking off the mound I think fans really enjoy position players pitching as well because it's something that doesn't really happen and like you said they're in the 50s and it's just something that you can tell they aren't pitchers as their main role but for you as a hitter and there's a position player pitching what do you look for like can you expect anything because obviously there's no film on them pitching yeah. I don't know. It is, it's unique. It's, um, I think the biggest thing is mentally, you just don't want to get out by a position <laughs> player throwing 60 miles per hour. But I mean, as you saw with Wyatt, he was striking people out. I think it's just so different. You're used to 95 and then someone throws 60 and it's just such a, it's almost like playing slow pitch softball, you know? So it, <laughs> I almost, a lot of guys are, they're just trying to draw a walk at that point. Like they don't even really try to, 
try to hit the the ball coming in on an arc like that. But I had, I can't even remember the last time I hit against a position player. So it doesn't happen that often. And normally the Indians are pretty quick, actually. So mm-hmm. I don't know. Try to get walked or something. If you're down 0-2, oh, though, mm-hmm. and, like, you can't see their pitches, like, you can't predict what's going to happen, is it that point where you just jump in front of a pitch, like, try to, like, lean your elbow in just so you don't strike out against a position player? Oh, man, if it's close to my elbow, I'm putting my elbow on it. <laughs> yeah. Love that. All right, well, let's go ahead and talk about um, in college, you were drafted in 2016 by the Cardinals. I always love hearing these stories. Um, I feel like every story is so different. So for you, where were you when you found out you were going to get drafted? And did you have a feeling or know that it was going to be the Cardinals? So this is kind of a funny story. Um, I didn't know I was going to get drafted or uh, – traded I had no idea but um so I was actually hunting with my friend Hunter and we were sitting in different different stands and it was up in North Dakota it was very cold it was in late November I think um maybe December I think it was actually early December so it's pretty cold in North Dakota I'm sitting in a tree stand and my phone keeps vibrating in my pocket and I look at it and I had a missed call from a number I didn't have um I was like, all right, it's too cold for me to take my gloves off and figure this out. I'll do it later. And then I got another buzz and it was a text and said, hey, this is Mike Gersh, GM of the Cardinals. Um, Can you call me? And it was snowing. It was windy. So I couldn't really talk to him there. And I was probably a half mile away from the truck. So I was like, oh, I don't get a call from Mike Gersh every day. So I better better walk back to the truck. So I walk back to the truck. I call him. He's like, hey, um, we've traded you. I can't tell you who for. and it was a pretty short call. And he's like, you'll go public in 30 minutes, then you'll know more. And then as it starts getting closer, I get more messages. And then my agent called me and he had a little more details. And then I went public and, and then my phone kind of was blowing up and I was doing some interviews just in the truck. And then I get a call from my friend who was sitting in the stand and he called me and he was like, hey man, I just shot a deer. So I was like, oh wow, crazy time. So I am... <laughs> doing interviews in my truck, driving across this field in the snow, trying to find this deer that he shot. And yeah, it was just a crazy night, but it was, it was cool. And it's a unique story. So I kind of like telling that one. I love it. And so the player that you were traded for is, I mean, I grew up in Arizona, 20 years in Scottsdale. Everybody loved Paul Goldschmidt. I don't think there was anybody that could ever say anything bad about him. He was just an amazing person, amazing player. So I think just Arizona wise, the news blew up and there were so many mixed reactions. But for you, did you feel any pressure? Because it was you, Luke Weaver and Carson Kelly, three players that obviously you guys have all done really well with the organization. But knowing that it was for Paul Goldschmidt, did that add any extra pressure for you? Um. I don't think it did. I think that it was cool because it blew up on, on like sports center and ESPN and stuff like that. So it was really notable when it happened, but I guess when you go into camp, it's always the same thing. If you, if you produce and you play well, um, good things are going to happen. If you don't, um, obviously it's, it's going to go the other way. So when you think about it, like that, it doesn't really matter who you got traded for or anything like, that. I mean, it's, at the end of the day, you have to take care of your stuff and then everything will work out how it's supposed to, you know? Mm-hmm. Well, it's definitely, like I said, worked out for the three of you. Um, when you got to Reno last year, you had an amazing first game. I had to text Jackson, though, because I was like, I know I bragged about Andy, but I can't remember what he did. So Jackson actually remembered. He said, I don't know if you'll remember, but he said the aces were down 4-3 in the bottom of the eighth. It was bases loaded. You hit a bases loaded clearing triple. We won 6-4. It was your first hit with us. So just at the AAA level to come in first game automatically make an impact. Um, How important was that for you? I mean, it was good to get the first one out of the way. I mean, it took until the eighth inning. But, um, yeah, I mean, to get the team a win, too, it was really cool. Um, Just late in the game, put them up and then get a win. And then it's your first hit. So it was really cool. and and. Mm -hmm. I think every time you move levels, it's kind of like, hey, you want to feel like you belong and you want to make an impact right away because, I mean, things can move quickly, you know, if you if you don't produce or whatever. So I think that it was kind of like, all right, we got the first one all the way and now we can settle down and, and um, get back to our game, you know. So that was cool. And I do remember that. 
There you go. See, I sat there every game, even on my days off. I would still sit next to the dugout, check different scores for crony, keep them updated, chat with everyone. But like actual game moments, I know games took four hours. I know there were walk-offs, but like it all blends together for me at this point. But you did have an awesome season with Reno for the time that you were there. Um, I know it got down to the final series, I think, in SAC to figure out, oh, we needed all these teams to lose for playoffs, which didn't happen. But for you and Reno, what was your favorite moment of the 2019 season? Oh, man, it had to probably be uh, Decker's walk-off home run for his last um, his last career at bat. That was mm-hmm. probably one of the coolest things I've ever seen on a baseball field. And then just to be a part of that, I mean, that was definitely the coolest thing that, that I saw last year. Yeah, Cody was such a character, too, because it was, I think, earlier in that homestand, I was on the field pregame, and he leans over and he's like, Courtney, on this day, can you make the hype video all about me? And I'm like, um, I can ask, but that's going to take forever of just Cody Decker highlights for the hype video. And we yeah. ended up not being able to do it. But I was like, that's really weird that he's asking me to make a video of him. And like, wouldn't really tell me why he like hinted at retirement. Um, but then for the walk off, I mean, it was cool because the fans didn't know that he was going to retire after yep. that. But it was one of those moments where, I mean, we still play the replay of it. Um, just how excited everyone was. It was so cool. Yeah, um, I think they kind of had to keep it quiet, but um, a few guys in the locker room knew. So I think that's why everyone was so excited. And it was so cool. I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't draw it up better. You know, that's mm-hmm. stuff that movies are made out of. So that was really cool to see. Yeah, and Cody's been around the game for a while. I think you either love him or hate him just because his personality. He's very honest. Him and I always got along. We'd always talk crap to each other. Um, on the field but just for somebody that's been known around the league um, to have that kind of kind of Cinderella story of I guess retirement was awesome but something even cooler happened to you following the season you got added to the D-backs 40 man Um, so I know I've heard different stories like some players expect that it's coming just through their agents through the team whatever it is but for you, did you know that it was going to happen or was it one of those things that kind of surprised you? Um, I think they kind of hinted that they were going to put me on and my agent talked to the GMs. And um, I thought that I, I was pretty confident that they were going to put me on, but that stuff changes so fast, you know. So um, I think they actually called me. Just these organizations wait until the last second sometimes. And I think I didn't get a call until a few hours before the deadline. So I was kind of sweating. But Oh, my um, gosh. <laughs> did kind of think that I was going to get put on, but um, it's always good to hear it officially, you know? Yeah. And this season was, I mean, a mess. I think, as you know, there was no minor league baseball. You guys had the summer camp um, at Salt River Fields, but for you, you finally got your debut in August of this year. Um, I know normally players just imagine having the family and friends and all of that, but for you to make your debut, I think it was like in the ninth inning for Cattell Marte or something like that. Um, how special was it for you? And was it weird that it was during COVID times or was it still just as awesome? Um, I think it was just as awesome. You know, it's, you definitely would have loved to have the family, um, mm-hmm. the family there because that's, it's, it's a big thing for me, but it's also a very big thing for them. And without them, I want to been there. So I really would have liked um, to have them there, but I think, Hopefully with this next year coming up, they can come to a game or something like that, and I think it'll be just as special. So um, everything doesn't always work out perfectly, but I thought it was very cool, and I think it was just as cool, you know. And how did it work out? Because normally I know, like, Crony would have called you into his office and told you um, at some point in Reno, but with it being only, I guess, 25, 30 minutes away from Chase Field, um, how were you told that you were going to be with the club? Um, I was actually driving back from an alternative site game and then Josh Barfield called me and he told mm-hmm. me, um, so yeah, it was, it was cool. It wasn't, it wasn't dramatic, like going into the coach <laughs> office and thing like that, but it was, it was definitely one of the coolest calls I've ever received. Yeah. And I know it was so fun to watch you. I know I like took pictures, tagged you on my Instagram story, like, 
with your first hit and all of that. And my parents got so annoyed. I was back home. Um, it was, I think, towards late August, maybe. Um, and I made them turn the D-backs game on because I, you were in the lineup. And I was like, everybody watch Andy's plate. Um, but it's so fun. And hopefully it's the same in 2021. Um, but for you as just one of the best people in the intro, I really hyped you up. I said you're like one of the best people on and off the field. Oh, thank um, you. Of course. So I guess, how do I phrase this question? So there's, how do I even want to word it without it sounding stupid? Um, I guess, so with, as you know, in Reno and just being around baseball, there's always those elements of off the field. I know the big league club will do like the PCH visits and make a wish and all of that. Um, but for 2021, just what are you most looking forward to? Because that human element and the community element of baseball in 2020 was gone. So what's the most important to you going into 2021 and really being able to connect with the Diamondbacks community? Um, the, so the, the people that work in the, in the offices and that set that stuff up do a really, really good job. So it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's really easy for me to, um, to go and do these things. They set up the shuttles, they set up the times, they even set up, set up certain events. So, mm -hmm. um, I guess personally, I like going to, um, like the children's hospital and stuff like that. That's my favorite stuff to do. So when they have those events, I just, I sign up for them. They kind of take volunteers and those are my favorite ones to do. But I guess like it's, I can't really take credit for doing that because people that work for the Diamondbacks and obviously the Aces too, they take care of all that stuff. And it's um, cool to see that these kids are so excited when you show up. Um, yeah. But yeah, those are my favorite events for sure. Yeah. I know you were so great um, when we did have, cause I worked with Washoe County human services. So the foster system, um, and the kids that we brought into the games, it was once a month, but they, a lot of them didn't really even know what baseball was. Like they, there was one kid who you weren't in Reno yet for, but he had no idea even how to throw a baseball. So Ruby De La Rosa, um, was teaching him how to throw a baseball and it just means so much. And just for everybody listening that maybe doesn't pay attention to the community aspect. I mean, it was like meeting a hero. For all these kids and there's a picture of us and the kid that I was introducing you to was very concerned with his Powerade over the autographed baseball from you <laughs> but it's like so amazing and I always brag about the people that make the time um so I'm excited for more people in 2021 to get to meet you and really see the impact because for kids that are playing or kids that aren't um really familiar with baseball you guys are the superheroes, you're the role models. Um, so I guess with that being said, there's a lot of kids now in COVID that they aren't able to play baseball. Maybe they're losing their passion because they weren't e able to even go to a game really to experience any baseball this year. Um, what advice would you give to those kids who maybe you're losing the fire, losing the passion for the game? What would you tell them to keep going and keep playing? Um, well, hopefully they didn't lose it. You know, they can, uh, baseball's a cool game where you can kind of um, have a few friends and play it in the backyard and COVID can be, make some of that stuff confusing with organized team sports, but I'm sure that there's a bunch of people that played some wiffle ball in the backyard and stuff like that. So I think that that's a great way to grow the game and to keep your passion and also to, to um, keep your skills there. So um I don't know. I would, just, I would say I would think, I mean, I know if I was a kid during COVID, I would have kept playing in the backyard with my friends and um, I wouldn't have lost any passion for the game. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know. I don't think, I don't think a lot of kids probably did if they really liked the sport. So that's kind of what I was thinking about it. Cause it's a game where you can almost even play with yourself sometimes get a tennis ball and a wall, you know, and, and yeah. you can play a piece of baseball. So um, I'm hoping that a lot of kids didn't, didn't lose their passion for the game. I like it. And that's very true. I have two younger brothers who play baseball. My brother, once he got to U of A, he stopped playing, but my younger brother still plays at high school um, in Scottsdale. And you're right. Like those days of just throwing the tennis ball against the wall. I mean, they would do that for hours. And I think it's a really good point where, you know, if you have the passion, you're right. Hopefully you didn't lose it. Um, but for you going into 
this off season, I know you just had your recovery from the injury, but, and then into 2021 for you both personally and professionally, what are you most looking forward to doing and accomplishing? I mean, it's for one, I just hope it's a normal year getting closer to normal. I hope everything starts on time. Mm -hmm. So I'm able to get back to a little normalcy here. Um, I, I want to just feel ready. You know, I want to, um, this is my first off season that I'm spending in Arizona. So it's kind of nice to get outside all the time and be closer to the facility and work out with those guys more often. So I think um, I'm just going in, I'm going to be ready and I'm going to try to win a spot. And um, after that, I think everything takes care of itself, you know, and, and like I said, um, off the field and as a person, I try to do as much as I can. I don't really know exactly what that means yet because mm -hmm. you do such a good job of setting that stuff up for us. But I mean, when the opportunities are there, I'm definitely going to jump on it. All right. And then on this show, I always talk food. I have not eaten today. I've had like two giant coffees, but food is on the brain. So I want to know, I, with our soccer guys, I always ask who's the best chef, but for you, do you cook a really good off season meal? Um, I have a few meals, yeah, that I like to make. I like making um, – I got pretty good at searing ribeyes and baking them in the oven just because it was – yeah, it's, it's a good way to make steak. And when it's negative 40 in North Dakota, you learn how to make things without using the grill outside. So I kind of got good at doing that, and I still do it. Even though it's, it's 75 degrees and sunny, I still kind of like baking the steak. So I think that's my, that's my go-to meal. Um, uh, if you're asking the best chef, um, Travis Snyder makes an incredible kosher salt steak. Ooh. And I should try to make it his way. I was actually asking him about it the other day, but he is very, he's very good at making food. That's true. I feel like I always see, well, not so much now, but always on his Instagram story, like he was always posting these like pictures of this meat. And I, the most I can cook is salmon just on the stove because I can't grill. I can't do any of that, but I think I saw on your Instagram story, your meal that you were making a couple of days ago. And I almost asked you how you do it, but then I was like, there's no way in hell that I could even try this. It's actually, it's pretty easy. I think you can do it. With limited cooking skills, like mine are salmon stir fry and pasta. You think I could do it? I think you could do it. Yeah. All right. I'll try and let you know how it goes. All right. <laughs> um, so also, with COVID and off season, everybody's binge watching Netflix, Hulu, whatever it may be. What is your go-to TV series on there that you would recommend? Goodness. I watched so many shows during COVID. I don't even know what my go-to is. I just running through shows, finish it, start a new one. I think recently I just finished like the Queens Gambit and got me into a little chess, um, wanted to buy a chess board and learn about that. I thought that was pretty interesting. Uh, man, what else did I watch? I watched a show called Maniac, which was kind of crazy, but it's just, you have so much time, you watch so many shows, and some of them I feel like you don't even like, but you're like, well, what else do I have to do, you know? So yeah, it's been, it's been funny. The ones I got really into are Elite and Money Heist. Did you watch e either of those? Um, I watched Money Heist. Yeah, I like that. It was, I wish I knew Spanish, but I did like the show. <laughs> right? I know. I was obsessed. I'm trying to learn Spanish, just working in baseball, and it's not working. But I think there's a new season coming out. But that one's really good. And then did you watch, um, what's the new version? It's like the, what was, it was Haunting of Hill House was the first one. But then there was a second series that kind of went off of that that just came out in October. Have you seen that one yet? Yep, I watched both of them. I think the second one is like man, something manner, you know? Yeah. Is it good? I thought that they were both really good. If you like scary stuff. And I think those kind of came out right around Halloween. So it was kind of mm -hmm. just festive. And I really liked watching those two. Really good shows. The first series or whatever, first season, whatever. That one was scary. And I'm all for scary movies. But with the first one, I like had to have the lights on and I could not <laughs> sleep after it. But the second one's just as scary. Um, they're pretty similar. Yeah. All right. Perfect. Well, Andy, <laughs> thank you so much for joining me on the show. I'm really excited. I, I said this to Dupe. I hope I don't see you in 2021 because that would mean you're in Reno. But 
um, you know, if it happens, whatever. But I'm so excited for everything that you got to accomplish in 2020. And for everybody that wants to follow you on social media, where can they find you? On Instagram, I am A underscore Y 15. And then on Twitter, I think I'm Andy J Young 15. So give me a follow. Yeah. <laughs>